A fake war started to distract the public. A sex scandal in the White House. A depressed politician who unintentionally stumbles into the power of pandering. A deep dive into the essence of power and voters' intelligence. All this and more in the latest episode of Double Feature. Welcome to the latest episode of this segment, I'm your host Pedro, and the theme of today's episode is one that's aligned with current affairs. Of course, I'm talking about the upcoming presidential elections, an event that takes place every four years and that will directly or indirectly impact you personally. This is the worst! Well, this year the choices are pretty grim. You either vote for the candidate who has declared an open war on ALF, the illegal alien who ate cats, or the political equivalent of fear and loathing in Las Vegas. A politician that flopped hard and was derided by pundits when originally presented to audiences only to be elevated to a cult status, but without any merit or quality. Why are conservatives bad, mommy? Because I thought we were supposed to conserve things. <laughs> Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit amphetamines. But fear not. No matter how dark things get, we can always count on movies to provide us with proper escapism. And we're in luck, because for decades Hollywood and world cinema have been tackling the topic of politics with varying degrees of seriousness. One of the first examples of a major Hollywood production tackling political subjects can be found in 1939's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The James Stewart starring vehicle about a naive, newly appointed United States Senator who fights against government corruption. The 1960s saw the post-World War II optimism and trust in government slowly starting to erode, and titles became increasingly darker and serious. With movies exploring both the political backstage and the growing feeling of paranoia that eventually resulted in conspiracy theories. The last stage of this journey was satire, and no movie better captures the essence of this phase as Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, Doctor Strange Love. The 1970s saw satire mature, and 1972's The Candidate presented a more grounded yet sardonic take on politics. In the movie, we meet Robert Redford's Bill McKay, a proposed candidate for a losing election, who is given free reign in campaigning and the possibility of saying exactly what he wants. In a strange twist of fate, McKay starts rising in the polls. Movie magic. Of course, this could never happen in real life. Throughout the rest of the decade, American political satire in the movies became increasingly mundane, attempting to showcase the impact of political maneuvers on the common folk. The genre went on hiatus during the 1980s, with the subject of political power play being only addressed by Steve Gutenberg's Carrie Mahoney in the Police Academy series. But the political and economic stability of the 1990s, along with the end of the Cold War, saw the genre's triumphant return. The titles made during this decade continued the trend that had started in the 1960s and reflected a darker, more cynical tone, emphasizing media manipulation, disillusionment with the political system and the blurring line between entertainment and governance. This shift reflected growing societal concerns about media control, political dishonesty, and the increasing corporatization of politics. What the American public doesn't know is what makes them the American public, all right? This trend continued in the following decades as filmmakers continued to use satire as a tool to critique how politicians and the media manipulated public perception, often presenting the absurdity of such tactics with biting humor and wit. This tone was often incorporated in other subgenres such as biopics as seen in Oliver Stone's production of 2008 W and Adam McKay's biopical satire Vice, released in 2018 and covering the life of Vice President Dick Cheney. Sadly, due to the current social climate, satire that covers all of the political spectrum is an endangered species. So today I'm bringing you two examples of satire from a time when the left could meme and poke fun at itself. Two titles that show how the truth is obscured by spectacle. Two movies that showcase the disconnect between politicians and the communities they serve. 
to entries that present sharp critiques of the media's role in politics, showing how it is used to manipulate public perception. So let's get to it. There's a crisis in the White House. What's the crisis? And the president's top advisors have been called together. Oh, jeez. The sexual misconduct occurred inside the Oval Office. With the election only days away, how much will this scandal affect the outcome? Now, Washington's top spin doctor... We can distract the press for 11 days till the election. I think we got a chance. ...has an idea. In Wag the Dog, we are presented with a scandal involving the incumbent president and his inappropriate encounter with a young girl. To deflect media attention from the controversy, the president's team enlists the help of Conrad Brand, played by Robert De Niro, a spin doctor known for his expertise in media manipulation. Brand's task is to create a distraction that will shift the public focus away from the scandal. The spin doctor decides to manufacture a fake war with Albania, using the conflict to dominate the news cycle and prevent the scandal from damaging the president's reputation during the upcoming election. He recruits Stanley Motz, a Robert Evans-like mogul played by Dustin Hoffman. The Hollywood producer is tasked with creating the illusion of the war. Motz brings in a team of professionals to stage events, from fake news footage to special effects that simulate the war on television. They even fabricate a heroic rescue of a fictional American soldier, Sergeant William Schumann, to gain public sympathy and support. As the fake war escalates, the media and public are entirely taken in by the deception and the president's approval ratings rise. Complications do arise when certain aspects of the hoax begin to spiral out of control. Hiding behind the brilliance and simplicity of its screenplay, penned by none other than Hilary Hankin and David Mamet, lies the paradoxical gloomy nature of Wag the Dog's plot. A timeless yet dated story that reminds us of the general public's continuous willingness and ability to be duped, showcased by events that took place in the 1990s. The book that inspired the movie had been published in 1993 and speculated that the Gulf War, codenamed Operation Desert Storm, had been scripted and choreographed as a ploy to get George H.W. Bush re-elected in 1992. Of course, the movie would be forever linked to pop culture as it was released months before the news broke on the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal and the subsequent bombing of a pharmaceutical factory in Sudan. And because life often imitates art, the Clinton administration even released the sequel when it initiated a bombing campaign of Iraq during Clinton's impeachment trial, also in 1998. Wag the Dog also finds director Barry Levinson indirectly touching on decades of paranoia and conspiracy theories such as the staging of the moon landings, as he delivers a movie that did fake news before it was cool. One that reminds us that war is show business and that politics and entertainment usually go hand in hand. The whole message delivery is boosted by a set of stellar performances. Dustin Hoffman delivers a standout performance as Stanley Motz, the eccentric Hollywood producer who orchestrates the fabrication with unflinching enthusiasm. Hoffman's nuanced portrayal perfectly balances humor with subtle critique, making Motz both comedic and tragic, in his obsession with the spectacle. Robert De Niro is equally compelling as the cool and calculating spin doctor Conrad Breen, who effortlessly navigates the intricacies of deception with charm and precision. Their chemistry drives the film with Hoffman's flamboyant showmanship, contrasting De Niro's understated pragmatism. It also defines the title's subtle comedic tone, one that doesn't rely on gags or stunts. Additionally, we find Woody Harrelson as a deranged army convict who stands in for a missing POW, another tool used to distract the public, and Willie Nelson as musician Johnny Dean, who even composes a theme for the rescue veteran. I think this is one of the aspects that dates the movie since we no longer find musicians supporting political causes and the general public isn't a herd of gullible sheep that blindly obeys the singer. There's also a minor role taken by Kirsten Dunst, who has a funny interaction with Robert De Niro's Conrad. Yes. All kidding aside, when this goes national, I get to put it on my resume? Actually, no. Because, like, what is it, a guild thing or something? I mean... You can never tell anyone you did this. What, what could they do to me? Take them home to your house and kill you. 
Wag the Dog is a brilliantly crafted satire that continues to feel relevant today, driven by powerhouse performances and a razor-sharp script that skewers the absurdities of politics and media with biting accuracy. The title also has an interesting thematic trajectory. It starts by showcasing politics and entertainment as the proverbial Wag the Dog scenario, only to end by showing us that the two go hand in hand. Also, if you're looking for an additional title that mirrors the rise and fall of the Clinton administration, may I suggest Mike Nichols' Comacle about Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign, Primary Callers. A great pairing. By March 1996, Bob Dole and President Clinton had locked up their party's presidential nominations. And while California approached its primary with little fanfare or attention, Democratic Senator J. Billington Bullworth embarked upon the final weekend of his re-election campaign. You promised us federal funding to rebuild our community. What happened? Well, you, you haven't really contributed any money to my campaign, have you? Bullworth follows the story of Senator Jay Bullworth, played by Warren Beatty, a disillusioned and burned out U.S. Senator from California who is running for re-election. Bullworth is fed up with the political system and his own life, feeling trapped in the false promises and shallow campaigns that have come to define his career. In a moment of despair, he arranges for a hitman to assassinate him, effectively putting a contract on his own life. Believing he has nothing to lose, Bullworth abandons his carefully scripted speeches during a campaign stop in Los Angeles. Instead, he begins speaking candidly, expressing his frustration with the political system, racial issues, and the influence of corporate money on politics. His blunt honesty shocks everyone around him, including his campaign staff and the media. But it resonates with the public, who are surprised and intrigued by his sudden transformation. Warren Beatty's 1998 directorial effort was a critically acclaimed but commercially underperforming title that has only gotten better with time. The movie's real-life subtext can be appreciated in two distinct ways. First, as a vehicle that expresses Warren Beatty's very own dissatisfaction with modern politics and the democratic establishment. Beatty, a Kennedy liberal, pokes fun at the centrist entity the party has become and even mocks the white savior complex. Ancient history, like the Democratic Party. Senator Bullworth starts to behave like Disney circa 2015 when he discovers that pandering works. He drops F-bombs, N-words, and freestyle raps about the insurance companies destroying the American healthcare system and the Democratic Party's absolute indifference to black poverty and the American lower class. Idealism is a trait shared by both the actor and the character he portrays, and the notion that that idealism has faded is a concept that haunts them both. Second, there are uncanny parallels between Senator Bullworth and former President Donald J. Trump. Here we find a story of a political candidate that becomes shockingly and enormously popular by breaking every rule in the political playbook. This narrative had already been covered in Elia Kazan's 1957 movie, A Face in the Crowd, albeit in a more serious way, but still quite effective. Bullworth suddenly becomes the hottest thing on TV, and his newfound popularity encourages him to keep exceeding himself all the time. In fact, with his quasi-socialist utopian pandering, Bullworth comes across as a 1990s democratic version of Trump. Both the real-life politician and Beatty's character underline the point that the American system really is this dysfunctional. And not because of them, but because of all of those who came before them and shaped it. Donald Trump and several other elected leaders since 2016 prove that the Bullworth approach works. You just need an audience and a proactive bipartisan establishment that can effectively run a 24-7 damage control campaign. Because if both this movie and real life have taught us anything, is that power tolerates a clown, regardless of his political beliefs, so long as he never truly aims to run the circus.
Beatty's execution of Bulworth's character arc is both humorous and insightful, exposing the absurdity and hypocrisy of American politics while remaining entertaining throughout. It's the actor's best and most relevant screen work in 17 years. The movie's weakest point is the portrayal of the African-American community. Aligned screenwriters Beatty and Jeremy Pixar wouldn't dare to cross. Halle Berry and Don Cheadle do the best they can with the material they have, even if their characters are tame and somewhat stereotypical. Overall, the title is an outrageous satire about the dysfunctions of American politics that over time looks even more perceptive, albeit cynical, about the state of politics. So there you have it. Two recommendations that make up for outstanding alternative programming come the 5th of November. Once again, I'm Pedro from Vinyl and Celluloid. Thanks for watching. And if you're interested in finding out my thoughts on other movies, go over to my letterbox page where you can find over 450 movie reviews penned by yours truly. But until next time, keep the reels rolling.